What a week. Stocks surging again today as Fiat Chrysler becomes the latest company to offer big tax cut bonuses. Welcome, everyone. I am Trish Regan in for Neil today, and this is your world. How the White House is dealing with that firestorm in just a moment. But first, let's go to Fox Business Network's Deirdre Bolton with more on those tax cut bonuses. Deirdre. They are affecting different parts of the market, but take a look first at bank stocks up after numerous earnings report. You also had retail stocks higher, pushing markets to new highs. Trish, you said it. So Dow getting near that 26,000 mark. Just keeping in mind, six days ago, we were just talking about the new high of 25,000. S&P 500, NASDAQ also hitting new records today. Strategists saying there are numerous reasons for optimism in the market, one of which is strong consumer spending two-thirds of U.S. economic power. So this past December, the strongest holiday season in seven years. Sales, including restaurants, rose in December for the fourth straight month, making 2017 the strongest year for retail sales, and that is to say including dining since 2014. So you had Target, Kohl's, they were standouts for the session, standouts for the week. Auto sales, not part of that figure, but Fiat Chrysler stock closed at a 52-week high. The CEO, Sergio Marchione, announced that the car company would invest $1 billion in a Michigan plant, and its non-senior employees they get $2,000 bonuses as a result of the recent tax overhaul. The CEO is saying these decisions reflect the company's ongoing commitment to manufacturing in the U.S. He also said the company would be hiring about 2,500 American-based jobs. Tech, huge standout as well in today's session. For many investors, they're just sticking with the stocks that worked for them best last year. Apple, Netflix, Amazon, all touching record highs. Adding to the gains, you are looking at some of those numbers carried over from last year's performance. Some analysts, Trish, they are cautioning that stocks are getting expensive. We're in a nine-year bull market, but with unemployment at decades low level, companies investing and the American consumer feeling good, there are just as many analysts out there who say the stock market has more to go. Back to you, Trish. Pretty amazing. I mean, because here we are approaching 26,000, and uh, what, 25,000 was last week? It's it been was. an incredible run. Yeah, we hit five new records, uh, those milestones last year alone. So this has been on a tear. Uh, indeed, it has. All right, thanks so much, Deirdre sure. Bolton. Well, the market. I can tell you, it's ignoring all that noise out there, all that immigration talk that has people all worked up. It's ignoring it and is focusing on the positive stuff, that companies are giving bonuses as a result of the tax cuts, that the companies will have better earnings as a result of tax cuts, and that our economy is picking up steam. Hey, we're growing better than 3%. Imagine that. John Layfield joins us now with uh, whether or not it's going to keep going. And John... You know, so far, so good. What's amazing is the market's up 228 on a day when the mainstream media is obsessed with these supposed comments the president had to make just late yesterday. Yeah, fortunately, uh, being in the market, the market is apolitical. And so all this stuff going on in Washington, D.C., we have a very polarized country right now, and the president is a polarizing figure, just, just as the president uh, previous to him was as well. Mm -hmm. uh, America likes to argue over salacious stuff, but the market is doing incredibly well. You mentioned the 3% GDP growth. It had been 10 years, which was a record since GDP had been measured, that we were under 3% growth. We're starting to now see that 3% growth. We're seeing another year, uh, seven straight years, of 2 million jobs plus were created in this economy. You're seeing global C synchronized growth of GDP. The economy right now, unless there's something crazy happens in North Korea, Yemen, or India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. this market looks to be on uh, the good, good solid footing for the next two to three years. Oh, wow. All right. So we keep going up from here. If 26,000 yeah, is in the cards, what's next? Uh, look, absolutely. Uh, you had 13 percent of economists only see a recession in the next 12 months, according to the latest Wall Street Journal poll. Janet Yellen, in, in her last interview as, as a Fed head chief, she said that there was not a, a recession on the horizon. So unless something happens out there that is a systemic shock and oil mm -hmm. prices go crazy or there's some type of geopolitical event, it looks like this economy is going to be on solid footing for the, for the foreseeable future, which is probably two to five years. Mm -hmm. Is that, well, I, I don't want to get too political with you, and we can talk about this a little bit later, because I think a lot of Democrats are looking at this rather uh, with a little bit of chip on their shoulder because they don't necessarily want to see the market doing so well or the economy doing so well or wages going way up because it's going to make it harder for them come midterms. But to what do you attribute this growth that we have seen? Does the president play a role? 
Yes, he does. Uh, you look at the market, the, the, the growth that it had, especially uh, when he first got elected in November, the market was flat for almost two years. And then the market jumps about 8 to 10 percent immediately in the first month that he was elected. That was simply on the Trump news that he was elected. Uh, there's no other rational explanation for that. You're starting to see now earnings growth that is taking over. Wall Street Journal poll, the same one that measured how many economists see only 13 percent see a recession in the near future, also measured how much Trump is affecting this economy. And they gave him credit for this. Not all, not all the credit. The, the economy was doing better. The economy now is doing much better. And a lot of that has to do with deregulation and a business-friendly atmosphere. We had the highest CapEx spending we've had since 2007 last year, and that's a lot because companies feel good about the environment. Yeah, and that's going to get even higher given the tax cuts and given the fact that money can now come back to this country from offshore. And it's at least $2.7 trillion that's sitting over there. The president estimates it could be as much as $4 trillion. So that's a lot of money that can come to work for us. You know, a lot of uh, folks on the left, though, they'll tell you this has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Trump and everything to do with the groundwork that President Obama laid. What do you say to that? Like they won't credit. It's a political <laughs> world. But uh, the, the market was flat for two years preceding President Trump's uh, coming into office. Corporate uh, profits were flat. Uh, and all of a sudden, President Trump comes in office, the market goes on a tear. Now, that's not 100% attributed to President Trump. But a lot of it is. So you look, look at bank stocks, for example. Bank stocks, when they came in, President Trump came in, took a big jump. Sure, because also, you know why, by the way. All those investors thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win, and that would have meant more right. regulation for bank stocks. That, and so once he came in, they said, Alleluia. That would have meant more, more, more regulations. And that would have meant Elizabeth Warren was turned loose on bank stocks. Mm -hmm. So Hillary Clinton not getting elected meant that Elizabeth Warren wasn't there. You see, bank stocks go up. But right now, bank stocks, you had good earnings come out today. Analysts estimate that because of this tax policy, these tax cuts that came through, earnings estimates should go up 20 percent. So Incredible. stocks should go up 20 percent. Mm -hmm. They've only gone up 7 to 10 percent so far since the tax cuts have mm -hmm. been uh, formalized as they were going to happen. So you should have about another 10 percent run. Right, because earnings are going to be that much earnings better. Earnings estimates go up. Indeed. Well, John, right. it's good to talk to you. Thank you so much. It's nice to take out some of the noise now and then and uh, just look at what's <laughs> actually happening. John Layfield. All right, let's move on to the president's controversial immigration comments now. Earlier on Fox Business, I did speak with former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski about all the outrage you have seen in the media. And I want to share with you what he had to say. Watch. This is fake outrage by the liberal left and the mainstream media who doesn't want to focus on the real issue. They don't want to focus on the fact that we have a broken immigration system that this president has pledged to reform. They don't want to focus on the fact that this candidate pledged on building a wall on the southern border so that we don't have illegal immigrants coming across our border and killing American citizens. They don't want to focus on the fact that chain migration now takes up 44 percent of all the immigration that takes place in our country. Is that it then? Is this just one big giant diversion? Let's go to John Roberts. He's at the White House with a look at how this is all playing out and the mainstream media having a total field day. Yeah, uh, good afternoon to you, Trish. Well, if this is fake outrage, it's bipartisan fake outrage because the president is hearing about it from both sides of the political aisle, not to mention around the world. Hillary Clinton, the latest person to weigh in on the reports that President Trump said during a meeting in the Oval Office, something to the effect of, why are we taking so many people from S-hole, blank hole countries. Hillary Clinton tweeting a short time ago, quote, the anniversary of the devastating earthquake eight years ago in Haiti, she's talking about, is a day to remember the tragedy onto the resilient people of Haiti and affirm America's commitment to helping our neighbors. Instead, we're subjected to Trump's ignorant racist views of anyone who doesn't look like him. Should be pointed out, though, that the Clintons, in the wake of that devastating earthquake in 2010, both Hillary and Bill Clinton, uh, made some pretty big promises about earthquake recovery. Many of those promises have gone unfulfilled. The president denies saying the word asshole uh, in its entirety, at least, in a tweet this morning saying the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. And now Senators Cotton and Perdue, who were both at that meeting, coming forward to say, well, they don't recall hearing the president saying that in a joint statement to Fox News a short time ago saying, quote, we do not recall the president saying these comments specifically, but what he did call out was the imbalance in our current immigration system, which does not not protect American workers and our national interests. Senator Lindsey Graham, 
who was also there, did not confirm the actual language that the president used, but did say in a statement that he confronted the president about whatever it was that he did say, saying, quote, following comments by the president, I said my piece directly to him yesterday. The president and all those attending the meeting know what I said and how I feel. I've always believed that America is an idea not defined by its people, but by its ideals. So what happens to DACA now? Well, according to the president in a series of tweets this morning, there is a lot more work that has to be done. The plan that was brought to him yesterday by Senators Graham and Flake and then talked about by Senator Durbin and some of the other people in the room was nowhere near what the president wanted. The president saying that there's still huge problems with uh, chain migration and ending the visa lottery system. In fact, as we see the president boarding Marine One there at uh, the uh, uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Bethesda heading for Andrews Air Force base where he will depart shortly from Mar-a-Lago. What, what prompted the president to say what he said was a proposal that was floated by Senators Graham and Durbin that countries that were whose citizens were given temporary protected status in the United States, countries like El Salvador, Honduras, uh, as well as Haiti, uh, some African countries, well, as they said, instead of uh, renewing that temporary protection status, why don't we make them a priority in the visa lottery system? which then apparently provoked the president to throw up his hands and say, what are you talking about here? Why are we taking people from these countries and not taking them from countries like Norway? So, so Tricia, I mean, it's going to be a little bit of he said, she said going on about this. We've got it from multiple sources that that's what the president said. But inevitably, the debate is going to turn to the, the larger issue, uh, which is what to do about the so-called dreamers, because time is running out. Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is a distraction along the way, but that issue has to be addressed for sure. And we appreciate the context around the comments. John Roberts, thank you so much. Thanks, Drew. Uh, again, you just saw the president leaving there, Walter Reed, where he had his exam. He's heading to Andrews Air Force Base, where he will make his way then on to Mar-a-Lago for the weekend. Now, this story on the president's immigration comments, it's certainly a big one, without a doubt. But does it give one of the big three networks an excuse to just completely totally other ignore a major development that happened on these bonuses. Brent Bazell is exposing that bias for you next. January 20th, Cofundo is live for two hours from the nation's capital. One year after the inauguration, Neil breaks down the president's accomplishments, agenda, and how it all impacts you. Starting January 20th, don't miss Cofundo live every Saturday on the Fox News Channel. Well, the president started it, certainly, and the mainstream media has been more than happy to run with it, certainly. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, the alleged comments made during yesterday's meeting. The major evening newscast and morning shows, well, they spent nearly t 33 minutes, can you imagine, reporting and discussing President Trump's controversial immigration comments. But you know how much time they spent covering Walmart's tax cut bonuses and minimum wage hike? Around five minutes. And get this. Media watchdog Brent Bazell says ABC didn't mention Walmart not once. Brett, good to see you. Is this uh, a little okay. biased not to mention such a significant major story? I mean, that was also a big part of the news cycle yesterday. Well, let's put it in perspective, Trish. Um, for during, during the Obama years and, and going back before that, you've had the left uh, led by the national media uh, doing thousands of stories about the need to increase the minimum wage. And as they've talked about that, they've pointed the finger directly at Walmart. Walmart's response all, all along the way has been that, that, that you didn't have the, uh, the numbers that, that would allow it. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just didn't allow it. Well, what happened? Um, with the Trump tax cuts, the margins have changed immediately in such a way that Walmart announces an increase to $11 an hour and massive bonuses to its employees. Employees, you would if this were the the Obama administration, the media would be at the door of Walmart talking about hope and change and celebrating the results of the economic policies of Barack Obama. And yet, it's no, it's not the but it's not just the bias by commission, which you're seeing in this silly story in the Oval Office, but it's the bias by omission, where they're not telling the story of what's really going on in this country. Mm -hmm. This is huge. What's happening? Is it? in part because they don't want to see any success out of the Trump administration.
administration because that might mean success for President Trump and possibly another four years or you know, come midterms, the Republicans might have the upper hand because the economy is doing well. Is that in part what's motivating this in your view, Brent? No, it's not in part. It's 100 percent why. It, this is this is just it's the reason why. It's just as simple as this. They loathe this man. They are not going to give him, I've said this before, if he finds the cure for cancer, they'll attack him for not curing AIDS. There is nothing this man can do that they're going to give him credit for. You know, your, your, your colleague Neil Cavuto has been doing stories on the fact that the Dow hit 25,000, 25, the highest number in the history of man. Barely got a wink from anybody. This is an explosive economy. This is the media that have been saying that Donald Trump was going to destroy the economy. Mm -hmm. well, the sure. evidence is here and nobody's covering it. Well, they're still saying it. I mean, you have Nancy Pelosi that's been saying that this is effectively Armageddon, this tax cut plan, and that companies are doing nothing but giving crumbs to their workers. I mean, it, hey, last time I checked, a thousand bucks is a thousand bucks, and that's some real money to a lot of families all over this country, you, Brent. You know, what... what what 1.2 percent was becoming the new normal? We were being told that to get to get ready for that as the new normal in America, and now you've got top economists that are saying, scratching their heads, and they're saying, "Is it possible we could hit 4 percent this year? No coverage." Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it, there's a variety of reasons for it. In part, I think sometimes, uh, well, a lot of journalists are a little bored, frankly, by economics, or maybe they don't understand economics, but and so they would rather cover the silliness as opposed to actually covering the substance. But what you're saying is it's you, beyond that. If you go, if you go on CNN, I went on there a little while ago. It may have changed just a little bit, but not much. If you go on their website, you will see there are 12 stories on the front page attacking Trump for being, you know, the S word or being a racist. There are three other stories attacking Trump on something, and then one story on national news. That's CNN's news right now. And then their second level is the, is his, his his fitness, physical fitness, and it's about how he may be deranged. Yeah, and as you pointed out, ABC. See, one of the major network newscasts didn't even bother to do anything on the Walmart news. Again, it's a not news. major There's piece no of news. news. Wow. News well, anyway. is done. <laughs> Sadly, not here though. Not here, Brent. Not here, and not on the Fox Business Network. We still care about this stuff. Indeed. That's why Thank we're here. Thank you so much, sir. Good to see you. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Trish. Good All right, weekend. officials, giving new details as the frantic search for the mudslide survivors continues right now in California. We're going to have the latest for you. All right, take a look here. You've got uh, Marine One landing there, about to land at Joint Base Andrews, uh, where the president will then take off from Mar-a-Lago, where he will be for the weekend, likely another working weekend, as he's uh, been known to work right through the weekend there down in Florida. Uh, you can see uh, he, he had just returned from, uh, or is returning from his appointment there at Walter Reed Medical Center, um, and will soon be heading off for Florida. Search and rescue efforts, they continue for five missing in the deadly California mudslides. Adam Housley in Montecito, California with more on it. Hey, Adam. Hey, Trish. Yeah, there's still five people officially missing, though. The sheriff's department says that could go up and down. It has the last few days and continues to do so. Uh, they're hoping, and uh, there's at least a sliver of hope, that they still may find someone alive here. Uh, behind me, you can see some of the damage. Look at this massive tree that came crashing down all through here. All these rocks you're looking at right now, for the most part, were nowhere near here. Uh, they just came pouring down the hillside, ripping through the house up there in the distance. There's still urban search and rescue crews all throughout this area. To my left, you can. they've already gone through this home here, buried deep in mud. When you talk to the Sheriff here in Santa Barbara County, while the likelihood continues to diminish, they still have fully not given up hope. Disaster circumstances, there have been, you know, many miraculous uh, stories of people lasting many days. And uh, we, you know, we certainly are searching for a miracle right now. Right now, 17 remain, uh, 17 is the official number of those killed as young as three years old who lost a brother and a sister who were three and ten. There was a married couple in their, in their 80s, an elderly couple, so from three to 89, and again, still five missing. As we come all the way around one more time, I want to show you the size of some of these boulders. Some of the problems they're going to have here, Trish, uh, is just trying to fix the infrastructure. Look at that boulder. It is massive. There's no moving that. You're either going to have to blow it up or leave it where it is. To the right, just a bit more, you'll see another home buried in about five feet of mud at one end, and at the other end, it looks almost normal. That's what's so bizarre as you drive 
drive around this area. 10,000 people live here. Uh, 65 homes roughly have been destroyed. Another 260 uh, have been damaged. Um, so there is significant damage here. Also significant damage as well to the infrastructure. Uh, we're told the water system here has been damaged uh, pretty significantly. We know that the power, uh, there's lines down all over the place. There's a lot of areas that need to be cleared. In fact, this boulder over here where I'm at now, this thing is massive. Uh, this thing's six feet tall, roughly, and this is one of the smaller ones that has to be moved or blown up. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here, Trish. The evacuation order remains in effect for Montecito. We're told for probably two weeks in some areas like this, uh, significantly longer. Um, there's going to be a cleanup here. In fact, back over one more time, Keith, show, them, show her through here. The cleanup here uh, is going to take, in some cases, months, if not a couple of years. Uh, in some places, may never be dug out. It's, uh, it's truly a devastating uh, effect, and, and that came from way up there in the distance. Uh, that's where the fire was uh, last December, and the rains came roughly six inches, which poured everything down the hillsides and took out these homes. And if you keep going all the way down to the beach, all the way down to the Highway 101, it took out everything in its path. Trish? Devastating. It's <clears throat> really sad to hear, especially when you think of those poor uh, little kids. Anyway, thank you very much, Adam Housley. Uh, I want to go right now to a live picture uh, from Joint Base Andrews. You can see the president is about to get out of Marine One there because he'll be uh, heading down to Florida to Mar-a-Lago for the weekend. Uh, he's certainly had quite a day of it uh, and quite a night of it last night in terms of getting hit by every single side, the left and right, all up in arms about his comments, which he said he didn't actually make, specifically the comment about, well, one word, I should say, that has been repeated over and over again in the media, and I need not say it because you know what it is. Uh, he said he didn't say that, but uh, the context, as our John Roberts pointed out, surrounding all of this was effectively that he's frustrated. We don't don't have more in the way of a merit-based system. And as we try and come to some kind of resolution in terms of what to do about DACA, he wants to end chain migration, he wants to end the lottery system, and he wants to have a merit-based system, much like, by the way, the rest of the world actually has. It's not so easy to get citizenship in many, many other countries, and Canada included, in fact, and you have to prove your worth. So perhaps the system going forward would be, for example, for us to say, look, we need nurses or we need doctors. They are training nurses, well-educated nurses in the Philippines. Let's seek those nurses out as opposed to random handing out lottery tickets because we somehow think we need more immigrants from Afghanistan, shall you? So uh, he really wants to revisit all of this, reform it, change it. You see him there getting off of Marine One. He's going to have a busy weekend ahead, and likely he'll be receiving plenty more criticism throughout the weekend. As Brent Vazell just told us, uh, he can't do anything right as far as the media is concerned. They don't want him to succeed. They don't like seeing the market at levels such as we're looking at near 26,000, with GDP growth better than 3%, with wages increasing, hundreds and hundreds of companies coming out and saying they would raise wages, Walmart included in that. And the reason why is because they do not like him. And if he succeeds, that's a problem as far as they see it. Uh, they also would hate to see perhaps the uh, Republicans succeed in midterms. But if the economy is doing well, do not forget Ultimately, people do vote their pocketbooks. So the economy, the markets have a big effect on everything. Again, he's getting on the Air Force One there where he will take off for the entire weekend where he will be in Mar-a-Lago. We're going to have more right after this. You're looking at a live picture there of Joint Base Andrews, Air Force One about to take off with the president in it for a weekend trip to Florida. It's coming after the White House decided to waive sanctions against Iran, at least for the time being. Let's go to Fox Business Network's Blake Berman, who's at the White House with more on that story. Blake, fill us in. Hi there, Trish. Yes, and uh, the White House announcing via a paper statement today that the president would be waiving sanctions against Iran as it relates to the Iran nuclear deal, but saying that he is doing so because he wants to work with European allies to form some sort of a new ag agreement that would fix, he says, the flaws that he sees in the original Iran nuclear deal agreement. This was a very lengthy statement from the president today, and in part he explained it this way, saying, quote, this is a last chance in the absence of such an agreement. The United States will not again waive sanctions in order to stay in the Iran nuclear deal. And if at any time I judge that such an agreement is not within reach, 
I will withdraw from the deal immediately. Now, the president also said that he would look to work with Congress potentially on a bipartisan deal for a way forward on the matter. But he said that would have to include four central tenants, the first allowing for immediate inspections at all sites. Also ensuring Iran never possesses a nuclear weapon, does not have an expiration date, the deal, and draws no distinction between long-range missiles and nuclear weapons. Iran's foreign minister blasted the decision from the president president today, his comments in a tweet saying that this was a, quote, desperate attempt to undermine a solid multilateral agreement. Now, in a completely separate measure, unrelated to this, the Treasury Department also announced that it would be sanctioning 14 different individuals and entities within Iran. This relates to the Iranian government's crackdown on protesters there over the last week. The uh, Treasury Department also sanctioning the head of Iran's judiciary, in a statement, the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin saying, quote, the United States will not stand by while the Iranian regime continues to engage in human rights, abuses and injustice. Trish. Thank you so much, Blake. All right. Well, we all know about the big companies that are giving bonuses because of the GOP tax cut. Uh, we've been talking about it here for the last couple of days. But you know what? It's not just big companies. It turns out that the bosses of the smaller companies, they are also handing out extra cash to workers, too, including none other than Steve Califer. He's chairman of Flemington Car and Truck County in New Jersey, and he's giving more than 700 full-time employees $500 bonuses, and that is great. I love hearing that. I love hearing that, Steve. Well, if you liked hearing it, you should have had the feeling I did when I met with my general managers and said, we have tax reform. Mm -hmm. We're not sending the money to Washington. We're going to send it to the people that create the income from us, our employees. Flemington Car and Truck Country gets it. So what did your employees say when they heard this? It was a mixture of applause. They were stunned, applause. But let me give you some anecdotal stories. A single mother comes up to me and says, with that $500, I have a tuition bill on my table. I know Nancy Pelosi doesn't understand that, but my employees do. I had a technician hug me because he spent too much money for Christmas. Wow. But those go on and on. That's what tax reform does. Well, you mentioned Nancy Pelosi, and uh, I've, I've suggested that she is going to go down in history as the Marie Antoinette of the Democratic Party, really, because when she's talking about you know, $500 or $1,000, for that matter, being crumbs, what she doesn't realize is that the majority of Americans, they don't have the money for their car should it break down next week. They don't have any extra savings stashed away. So 500 or $1,000, and I don't want to play this for you because in case you missed it, everybody should hear this. They really should. Here is Nancy Pelosi. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. It's so pathetic. Now, is that what you're doing? Are you putting the schmooze on, as she would say? No, we gave our hard, cold cash where it belongs, to the people that work for us, instead of sending it to Washington. Yeah. She, won't pick up crumb, cl she won't pick up crumbs because her Louis Vuitton shoes will get dirty. You know, it, it shows you how there's such a... This is in part why the president succeeded. There is a division there, a divorce between these politicians that live one kind of life and the people that they're supposed to be serving, the people, frankly, that are employing them. And Nancy Pelosi is one of the, the biggest examples of that in that she has had a very sheltered existence, uh, a very wealthy existence, and $1,000 is nothing, perhaps, to her, but it is real money to everyday Americans. And I guarantee you there isn't one Walmart employee out there that isn't thrilled, just as you said your employees are thrilled. So let me go further. Let me ask you this. When your employees make the connection between we got this money as a result of the tax cuts, are they willing to look past, well, some of the quote unquote deficiencies that many see in Donald Trump? In other words, when the media is talking about, oh, he said this, that and the other, do they say to themselves, I got 500 more dollars because of what he did? This is about reality, and reality is a paycheck. Reality is making certain that everything counts. And at Flemington Car and Truck Country, our employees are making the connection. Government doesn't pay them. 
our customers pay them, and the company cares about them. So when you say, how's that going to relate? It is simple. It is, and it will. You gave me your company coin here, your motto, which is to be kind, be fair, work hard, earn money, and do good. That's what we do every day, and that's what entrepreneurs do. Forget the headlines. Forget the sensationalism. This is about families. It's about capital formation. It's about the future, and that's why we gave the bonuses. We weren't looking to be gratuitous. We were looking to be real. And let me tell you, I'm happy. Good. Congratulations, sir. Good for you. And I'm happy that that woman can pay that tuition bill. That's and great. I want to thank my partner for helping me do that. Thank you. Good to see you, Steve. All right. Kentucky becoming the first state to get the green light on work requirements for Medicaid recipients. How's the governor responding to critics who here are calling it now heartless? We're going to ask him. Matt Bevan is next. All right, just hours ago, Kentucky becoming the first state to get approval to require Medicaid recipients to work. The state's Republican governor, Matt Bevin, joins me right now by phone. And Governor Bevin, uh, you're getting some criticism for this. Why do you think it's the right thing to do? It's interesting. Criticism always comes from liberals. They have no solutions. They are writing failed policies, but anybody who would propose an alternative uh, is quick to receive their scorn. I believe it's the right thing to do because I grew up in poverty. I grew up with no access to health care coverage for the first 20-something years of my life. I was an active duty Army officer before I ever had access. And I understand that, as uh, Administrator Verma put it the other day, it is absolutely soft bigotry. Low expectations is not what people in America need. The dignity that people get and receive from the opportunity to do for themselves, to be engaged in their own health outcome, is what ultimately leads to better health outcomes. When people have a vested interest in anything, they are more likely to care about it, to utilize it, and to get the maximum value from it. I am utterly convinced from personal experience that having that opportunity is the greatness of America, and we owe it to people to give them that chance to improve their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the problem with welfare is that it becomes a bit of a trap. And, uh, you know, it, it, you can't go to work because you're getting that much from the government. And uh, then you just want more from the government. It's that much harder to go to work. You think about, say, a single mom who makes a rational decision, perhaps, to stay home because she may have more money coming into her via the state, via the federal government, than if she were to actually go to work and have to pay for daycare and have to pay for gas, et cetera, et cetera, and be away from her kids. So it seems to me that there should be some kind of in-between system, Governor, where we're doing what we can to help people to help themselves. And is this one way, via this Medicaid reform, a way of doing that? Absolutely, Trish. And I'll tell you, it's interesting. This is the first federal entitlement reform that we've seen since the mid-90s. This is, this is going to be transformative, not just for Kentucky, but as a model for the nation, because it will give millions of people who are in that trap that you've just described the opportunity to get out. Medicaid and other entitlement programs were not intended to be life destinations. They were not intended to be dead ends. They were intended to be transitory situations for certainly able-bodied people, people with alternatives. We want to provide those alternatives to them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in this waiver is exactly that, the ability to come alongside existing uh, requirements and transition people to the private sector, mm -hmm. transition them to traditional and commercial health care provided by employers because they're out there working. And if for some reason that employer program is not the same that they would have gotten under Medicaid, that will come alongside and make up the difference costing the taxpayer right. less. And, and, and I just want to point out, uh, you know, for your sake, that if, for example, you had a single mother that couldn't work, you're not going to force her to work and, you know, perhaps take the kids in tow to that. And somebody who was very, very ill and couldn't work, uh, that person as well would not be forced. You're talking about able-bodied people that have time on their hands that could do it. But let me go to something else, and that's, uh, well, shall we say the headlines that the president has been making uh, since around this time yesterday. What do you make of that? What do you think needs to happen on immigration reform? And is this rhetoric going to get in the way? Honestly, I've been focused on two things. Number one, my meeting with the president is related to prison reform. Uh, then since then, I've been focused on what we're doing as it relates to transitioning uh, Medicaid requirements mm -hmm. for the first time in America. I've not focused on what his commentary has been on that front. 
uh, as it relates to immigration really? reform, we I need to I guess you weren't it. watching CNN then. <laughs> I, have, I have not. I, I don't spend much of my time watching good, CNN. Good answer, good answer. But that said, um, you know, I'll fill you in. that Everybody's up in arms about this, and, and they're concerned that he said some racist things by suggesting that we would be better off having immigrants from countries like Norway as opposed to, say, Haiti or other places in Africa. Do you interpret that as a racist comment, or do you think he was really Really, perhaps just commenting on uh, the, the fact that you know per capita GDP in some countries is a whole lot higher and you have a more educated population than in other countries without professing to be an expert on all that has been said or, or certainly can't speak for what somebody meant here's what I know so many are quick to decry as anything they don't agree with a comment to be racist if everything is racist we diminish the reality that racism truly exists and I find it offensive as a father of black children and a father of white children, that people are so quick to be dismissive of certain things and to categorize them as racist. I happen to have children that were born uh, both in this country and outside of this country. And the fact of the matter is America is a nation of immigrants, and people know that. And getting hung up on any vernacular, appropriate, inappropriate things that might have been said, word choices that might have been different. The reality is this. We as a nation have an obligation and a responsibility to look out for our people first. And by our people, I mean people who are citizens of the United States. And yet we are a nation of immigrants. And we have always been a nation that welcomed people in, the huddled masses and others beside. And nobody, including our president, to my knowledge, is saying that we should be anything other than that. But what he and I think many others and myself would agree with is that we've got to take care of those that are here first. A nation has a responsibility to protect its borders, to take care of its citizens, and that we get to dictate the rules by which people become citizens. And I think as speaking as a governor and as a taxpayer and a citizen and as a father and as somebody who cares about this, I think we need to make it easier for people to come here legally and make it harder for them to come here illegally. It's not that complicated. I know that's what our president is fighting right. for, and I think people should focus on that and not allowing themselves to be whipped off into tizzies right. over some word choice, which is what I believe is the catalyst behind mm -hmm. all that. Well, you say that also very eloquently, sir, and uh, you make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, there's a reality here that we need to focus on as opposed to the uh, circus distractions going on. Anyway, thank you, Governor. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you so much. All right, relations with the UK seemingly not okay. Trump canceling a trip to London, and the mayor there is firing back. Well, where is this standoff heading? President Trump announcing that he is canceling a trip to London to open the new US embassy because it was, quote, a bad deal. The London mayor saying, well, he's not welcome, that he finally got the message. Joining us right now with more national security expert Rebecca Heinrichs and former press secretary for Vice President Mike Pence, Mark Lauder. Good to see you both. Mark, starting with you, uh, what do you think of the London mayor's comments? Well, I think they're disgraceful. I've had the ability to work for, for politicians over much of my ad adult life. And I can't tell you the number of times we welcomed a, a political office holder, maybe even from a, from a different party whom we had very little in common with on a policy side, but we greeted them at the bottom of the plane. We welcomed them to our city or state, and we did so as, as, a, as a sign of respect to the office. I think it's disgraceful. Hmm. But, Rebecca, could we even be surprised by this? Because, effectively, he's just joining you know, the chorus of uh, media members here in the U.S. that are spouting their multi-concerns about the president. Right, and he's not the only one. Jeremy Corbyn, the head of the Labor Party, um, was calling for protests uh, for, in, in, you know, when President Trump was supposed to visit. So, um, you know, but listen, you know, the, the UK-US relationship is a special relationship. It's going to endure long after President Trump is gone. Um, so I think there's a danger or a risk in making too much out of this. Um, there's 400,000 UK personnel embedded with the United States military right now. We're cooperating on intel. The relationship is still good, and I think there's a risk in making too much out of this. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about this embassy because the president, you know, this is this is his field that he comes from, real estate, and uh, he's criticizing the Obama administration, Mr. Lauder, uh, for selling this thing for what he says was peanuts and uh, enabling it to be acquired by a Qatari-owned development firm that is actually proposing to transform it into a 137-room, five-star hotel and spa. 
I mean, the president, if he knows anything, it ought to be what would command a high price for some real estate that's going to become a five-star hotel and spa. Uh Absolutely. And the one thing that we know is that the president of the United States hates a bad deal, whether it's the <laughs> Iran deal or whether, I mean, let's remember in the first hundred days, he saved hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars in the cost of the new Air Force One aircraft. And here he is once again saying,